the year is 1998. From Software is hot off the success of the Kingsfield series and just established their new franchise with Armored Core and its follow up project Phantasma in 1997. It was around this time where From Software split into multiple teams one, to produce more Armored Core, two, other groups to develop experimental titles to supplement their main franchises, and finally, one that would continue developing more first person action RPGs. This team was comprised of both new and old members who had already worked on the Kingsfield series, with Natoshi in, the franchise's director, being at the helm of the very next project. They didn't want to make a sequel, however, and what resulted from the decision to make a drastically different dungeon crawler led to a black sheep. Shadow Tower is much darker in tone and somewhat more clunky in gameplay, but its aesthetic and deeper mechanics are a refreshing new direction for the series. When I had first played the game years ago, I had only experienced Kingsfield 4, and my time was very uncomfortable, rocky, and confusing. But after playing through the Fortnite trilogy, I've discovered a new love for the game, as it does so many unique things in the series. Over the course of my second playthrough, I realized that Shadow Tower is designed to make you uncomfortable, and every feature revolves around that core aspect to immerse you in its dreadful world. However, it lacks quite a bit in the story department, especially compared to the steady buildup of lore from the Verdi trilogy, Shadow Tower's prologue is very underwhelming. It reads like something made up by age tech localizers, especially with a name like Ruse Hardy, and a nonsensical tale about Granny's cooking being the sole motivation for him delving into a dark, murderous tower with only a battered sword in hand. The Kingsfield Manual prologues have never been anything crazy, but they all read way better than Shadow Towers. This is probably the lamest story introduction out of any of the games, and I would have preferred nothing over this weird character motivation. The game itself doesn't draw any mention to this, opening with only the fact that a town was swallowed by the tower, and I do like the concept of an ancient curse residing within the land. The game does well to keep any unnecessary info out, leaving a lot of speculation as to why you're there or what the Shadow Tower really is, putting the player in a shadow of mystery and speculation that goes well in parallel to the stressful and confusing experience of delving into the tower itself. It's probably the only way the barebones lore and storytelling of Shadow Tower can work. If the developers tried to include as many named NPCs and stories as Kingsfield did, it would fall flatter and take away from the unknown that permeates the Spire's walls. We have no idea what the purpose of the Shadow Tower is, other than the fact that it houses an incredibly powerful crown that can grant any wish, presumably luring and corrupting many adventurers over the centuries, likely where most of the dried out corpses result from. That unknown is what makes the tower so threatening. This is a terrible place where demons and abominations congregate, below even the deepest depths of mortal kind, giving the clear signal that you are not supposed to be here. This is just the introduction to Shadow Tower that establishes an important underlying sense of danger and unease within the player. Loading in, you'll quickly realize the full extent of the game's atmospheric horror. It's quiet. You can hear them writhing within the shadows, whispering at you within the walls. Demonic incantations and curses uttered in the stagnant air. Shadow Tower has no music, which is probably one of the few things non-players do know about the game, but the reason as to why still eludes me. I tried digging through as many early FromSoft interviews as I could, which isn't a lot when these things are long delisted from the internet. I found scarce coverage of Shadow Tower, let alone anything that explains the design choices made for the game. It's likely that the removal of background music was an artistic choice, because it works very effectively to create an unsettling, if not scary, atmosphere at times when in tandem with the far more involved sound design in comparison to the Kingsfield series. Many enemies make unique sound effects, other creepy noises will occasionally play in the background, and even less frequently environmental ambience that typically only plays in the central tower. Compared to Kingsfield 3 that doesn't even have walking sound effects, enemies that typically only make an attack noise with far less variation, and its ambient noises only come from rivers and howling cliffs. It's clear that there is a greater focus put into environmental sound design, but 
on its own doesn't seem like enough to warrant the complete removal of music, as this effort could have been from the beginning before music was entirely removed. I think this mostly because the environmental ambience is too lacking. Far too many areas are completely silent and between the eerie groans of enemies, a subtle background theme would go a long way in giving more life to these areas that could be rather dull when slowly and quietly walking through them. If you kill most of the enemies, it's essentially silent, besides the occasional creepy unrelated noise. The only benefit to this is whenever Ominous Ambience does play, in a random area, it can cause more fear and uncertainty as to what's coming, even if it is just background noise. Hearing a deep rumble in a dark corridor can give the impression of a monstrous enemy. This is fucking terrifying. It's essentially the Silent Hill brand of atmospheric horror before that game even released. Although not as violently industrial with slamming washing machines and power drills, but Shadow Tower does deserve more credit as a horror game when its sound design can invoke such levels of discomfort and fear. That level of ambience rarely plays though, so we're left with what feels like a gaping hole in the middle of Shadow Tower's sound design, which gives me the feeling that a lack of music wasn't the original intention when creating the game. Even after all that, you still may not be convinced you may be wondering, how do we know for sure that music was removed from Shout Tower versus just not being made in the first place? The answer lies in Kota Hoshino, composer of the minimal songs that remain. Shadow Tower is my first assignment after joining From Software. Since Shadow Tower doesn't have any music in the game, there's not a lot of my music. On a side note, Evergrace contains some of the music that I originally created for Shadow Tower. Can you fucking imagine? Looks like you got your hands on it, all right. You will not go any further. I'll turn you to ash with my flame. Do you understand how dramatically different the game could have been with this kind of soundtrack? I would honestly love to see what the original soundtrack for Shadow Tower was. Evergrace is such a bizarre and unique soundscape that was already claimed to have a beta PS1 version, but now knowing that some of it also came from Shadow Tower absolutely astounds me as both games feel like complete opposites. I think the fact that Kota Hoshino composed a lot of original tracks for Shadow Tower that didn't make it into the game gives a lot of credit to the theory that the game was intended to have background music, much like Kingsfield, but somewhere through development was deliberately cut for one reason or another. Be that from artistic intent, wanting to further sell the creepy atmosphere that this game was going for, or possibly technical restraints of the music taking up too much space on the disc. The PS1 has resulted in a lot of impressive games, but I'm not entirely sure if Shadow Tower with music would push those boundaries. This game does have a lot of depth though, and boasts far better looking enemy models and environments, especially especially in comparison to the former Kingsfield titles. Part of the reason the horror in this game works so well is from the incredibly uncanny humanoid monsters, or the visceral flesh pots, and other gruesome designs that veer into disgusting or uncomfortable. Before Shadow Tower, I had yet to find many Kingsfield enemies that made me truly unnerved, but this game amps up that ratio considerably. Some of these designs seriously made me physically revolt, or hit the uncanny valley and gave me a deep sense of unease. Take for instance the wall butterflies. There's something about these monsters in particular, with a form so human being contorted into a large insect, attached high in the corners of a single room, crunching, watching you. It's deeply unsettling. Of course, there are a lot of regular designs that are just plain good, on top of there being over double the amount of unique enemies than there were in any of the Kingsfield PS1 titles, with 150 total monsters. That's a pretty impressive roster for the era, as the previous games only had around 60 to 70 unique enemies. It's one of the reasons why I'm on the fence on the technical restraints argument for the lack of music. On one hand, the audio files shouldn't take up that many resources, but if you consider that all of these monsters have at least one unique sound effect, and there are already 150 unique enemy models in the game, that has to take up a lot of space. The overall map of Shadow Tower is difficult to measure as all of its worlds are vertically stacked on top of each other, and well, there is no map, but it feels roughly Kingsfield 1 or 2 sized. Shadow Tower took me roughly 18 hours to complete while Kingsfield 2 was slightly faster at 17. Kingsfield 1 was cleared in 12 hours, so it seems noticeably shorter, but I placed Shadow Tower roughly in the middle of those two lengthwise as it has no sprint mechanic while Kingsfield 2 does. A lot of your time spent with
within the tower will be meticulously crawling through areas to ration out your resources to not meet an untimely death. Enemy density feels much higher when nearly every chamber is packed with two to four foes, some of which respawn on the spot. Contrast this with Kingsfield 2's half and half mix of dungeon exploration and combat, with areas much more spread out, but Shadow Tower is downright claustrophobic at times with such densely packed dungeons. This means the overall world map might be a little bit smaller than 2's, but feels equally as long due to it being built around your slow movement speed. Because of this massive bestiary, each area typically has entirely unique enemies. You often see each monster in only one or two rooms, never to be reused in later dungeons. This makes the spire feel so much more alive, and also adds a lot of variety to the game's combat when you're always fighting new enemies. Kingsfield doesn't reuse monsters in later areas all too often, but there is a much higher amount of the same type in any given area, as opposed to Shadow Tower mixing things up every couple of chambers. There are even a few rare monsters that have their own unique drop table and specific spawn location, such as... Okay, everybody. We're gonna be mature about this. The frog with fat fucking nuts. I only killed him six times for science, but he dropped a different, varyingly useful item every time, notably a warrior bow that was significantly more powerful than the common one you'd get in most playthroughs. I feel like I could kill him for an hour and still receive unique drops, not to mention the fact that I never found these same items anywhere else in my playthrough. As with many other enemies, they all have vast drop tables that can leave a variety of equipment each time you kill them. Dying in Shadow Tower not only means losing your progress, but sometimes any rare items you've picked up from enemies. They could drop nothing the next time you kill them, or perhaps you'll pick up a new useful magic ring while replaying an area. It not only helps to make combat more interesting by adding the excitement of rare drops, but also eases the sting of replaying segments after dying. The item system gives a ton of depth to Shadow Tower, and can make each run-through unique based on what equipment you have, since your combat capabilities are solely reliant on said gear. Let's say picking up a ton of rings allows you to cast way more magic than normally having to ration it out, or if you happen to pick up a lot of equipment with passive regen, you can play a lot more recklessly. Few pieces of equipment outside of combat are guaranteed, but the rest is based on chance and really makes the experience of fighting enemies even more exciting knowing you could get something useful from any creature. There is also a lot of variation in the stats of equipment. Between two identical swords, one can deal fire damage while the other will have a higher critical hit chance. You'll never know unless you look through the detailed equipment menu. Some items even have hidden abilities such as this Shield of Balance I found in the early game that mysteriously regens my HP despite saying nothing about that in the description. There is so much variation in unique iterations of any single piece of equipment that I wonder if some of the stats are randomized. I have no idea if the PS1 is capable of such a feature, but regardless, it adds more depth to Shadow Tower and makes it feel much more like a desperate improvised struggle to manage whatever equipment you can scrounge about against the hordes of demons trying to gut you. Not to mention the fact that every playthrough of the game will feel different, forcing you to strategize with the random set of weapons and equipment you're given. It's high time I delved into the deeper mechanics of Shadow Tower. I presume most viewers are familiar with the Kingsfield games, as I already drew many comparisons earlier, and the core gameplay of Shadow Tower is quite similar, while the rest of its mechanics and presentation create a far harsher and darker atmosphere. Yes, Kingsfield was quite bleak at times, but it had rest points and NPCs. You could take a break from the dungeon delving for a little bit and didn't feel like your life was constantly in danger. Shadow Tower, however, has almost no dedicated safe zones. Almost everywhere in this place is infested with demons or traps, and any checkpoint is still directly adjacent to danger, so you never quite feel at ease. There are occasional teleporters that take you to a shop with a standoffish merchant, and even fewer transport points that act as shortcuts to previous areas. But as I said, these places are still in the heart of the Shadow Tower. Even though these rooms are safe, there's still grimy dungeon caves with distant groans and whispers in the walls. There's no pleasant town for you to rest in. Just a constant reminder that you're stuck in the stone prison until you die. Practically everything in Shadow Tower revolves around creating this feeling of unending dread, from the ominous ambience and lack of music to the creepy enemy designs I've already mentioned, and even the rapid item degradation that forces you to ration out your resources effectively, otherwise facing an untimely death. The item durability mechanic is probably the most drastic difference in Shadow Tower, as Kingsfield 1 through 3 has no durability at all, and the weapons in Shadow Tower degrade very quickly. 
This isn't quite as bad as it sounds, because you'll be picking up many different weapons throughout your journey, and the purpose of this system is to force you to vary up your equipment and try out a bunch of new weapons in order to survive. Whereas you could previously stick with a few of the same powerful weapons throughout an entire Kingsfield game, especially with 3 with the evolving X Selector, which while cool, still fully allowed the player to only use a single weapon for the entire game if they felt like it. This especially goes for magic since rings are tied to durability, limiting your casts not only by MP, but the rapidly degrading rings as well, simultaneously beefing up magic as a result, turning it into an actually viable method of killing enemies, especially if they're weak to a certain type of magic. Kingsfield did not really encourage the player to vary up their magic use, instead, spamming the lowest level spells was the most effective way of stalling opponents and leveling up. Stronger spells were hit and miss, while sucking up a lot more resources, so they often went on used. Shadow Tower has far less spells, but you'll be using them sparingly for when they're most useful. And most spells are powerful or capable of stunlocking enemies effectively as a result. The only downside of Shadow Tower's magic system is there seems to be no sort of weapon magic, which is a real shame since it further lowers the variety of ranged or magic attacks the player can use. Sword magic was one of the most fun combat mechanics of the previous Kingsfield games. Two and three have diverse and powerful combos that practically override the use of regular magic, but all of that is suddenly missing in Shadow Tower. It kind of makes sense given the severely low durability of most weapons, magic would probably degrade them even faster, and some special weapons already have useful attributes like greater crit chance, HP regen, or elemental damage, but it doesn't seem like enough in comparison to some of the badass weapon combos you could do in previous entries. Shadow Tower is a game of constant resource management and long-term decision-making, not just from health potions you need to ration in order to survive, and not even solely from durability as you would expect, because in order to repair any of your items, it doesn't cost money, but your precious, precious blood. Not only do you have to play carefully to sustain your health against enemies, you also need to ration it out effectively to keep your equipment alive as well. All of your decisions have weight, much more than they did even in King's Field, all the way down to consuming an HP potion or repairing too many or too little items can lead to drastic consequences hours and hours down the line when you run out of health during a crucial moment or all your weapons break after an excessively long dungeon delve. Choosing to heal at the last possible moment before death allows you to stretch your very limited resources to their limits, walking the thin tightrope of death, balancing your power and consumables so that you can self-sufficiently make your way through the entire spire. Thankfully, there are still other vendors that allow you to trade in weapons or armor for HP potions, so if all that sounds too stressful for you, then don't worry. Combat is harsh, but not unfair. Like in Kingsfield 2, enemies and projectiles deal constant damage while their attacks touch you, but it feels much more refined in this game than it was previously. For starters, your health is massively inflated, which makes the constant HP drain from an attack way more manageable, especially if you know roughly how much damage you'll take. It allows you to strategically sacrifice some HP with a large safety net as well. Secondly, enemy hitboxes are much smaller and accurate to their model, allowing you to effectively dodge most of their attacks even while being partially in front of them, if their weapon doesn't realistically hit you. Of course, projectiles and AoE attacks still exist, and as a result deal a massive number on your HP at almost any stage of the game, but you can adequately outpace these attacks if you see them coming. Your weapons also have zero reach, even worse than in Kingsfield as all weapons seem to be the same length despite appearances. You practically have to be hugging the enemy in order to hit them, and hitboxes are even more finicky which takes some time to get used to. But since enemies have the same struggles, you're on an equal playing field. So despite the fact that you have no sprint button, and enemies still deal a lot of damage at a rapid pace, if you can maneuver effectively with the rigid controls and play intelligently, you'll be able to outmatch demons twice your size and strength. This all makes combat incredibly satisfying despite how clunky it can be. I can't emphasize enough how stressful this game can feel sometimes. Times. It's not something easily translated by just watching gameplay. You get immersed in the grungy dungeons, feel the real stress of managing your limited resources against hordes of constant abominations, feel the real fear of not knowing what those eerie groans beyond the pitch black fog were, and the real anxiety of being trapped in the deep unknown, risking an hour of progress in the most hellish and dangerous area you've been to thus far. This is why I consider Shadow Tower to be partially a horror game, as there were a couple times I was racked with anxiety anxiety and felt too overwhelmed to continue, but when you do inevitably surpass that barrier, the sense of accomplishment is incredible, especially when it feels like everything in this game is designed against you.
Part of that overwhelming confusion while playing Shadow Tower comes from the complex maze-like branching of its dungeons. Unlike Kingsfield, you have absolutely no map or sense of direction other than your own, which coupled with the complicated environmental design makes exploring the tower even more mentally taxing. This is another major aspect of the game that got easier after I played the rest of the series, as Kingsfield trains your navigational skills over time. Upon my first playthrough, I was very overwhelmed by all of the long branching paths that Shadow Tower offers, that typically expand into even more areas, some of which are difficult to backtrack from, making your decisions on what path to take all the more crucial if you don't want to get stuck in a harder area. My second time around, I had a lot easier time memorizing the dungeon layouts and only occasionally got lost, but still overwhelmed when offered three paths in the central tower. Playing Kingsfield beforehand really improved my mental mapping capabilities, and I feel it's the best thing you can do before delving into Shadow Tower, especially since its combat plays about the same and will allow you to appreciate all the unique changes the game makes. Exploration is still enjoyable, there are a few major shortcuts you can unlock throughout the game that make the Spire feel like a well thought out contraption. As I said before, the environment looks great and varied, especially in comparison to the grainy wall textures of Kingsfield 1. Sometimes there are scripted enemy spawns to ambush the player, which can be some of the most terrifying moments in the game, especially early on when the player has a little powerful equipment and is cornered by three massive cave worms. What the fuck, dude? Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh fuck me. How do I use magic? How do I use magic? The magic isn't working. Oh, oh fuck me. Or rushed from both ends by abruptly fast stone heads. Oh. Oh no. Get away from me. Oh. Oh. No, stop. There are also a few characters throughout your journey that you can meet who won't want to shred you into pieces, namely a cute rat fellow, a couple of guys who mess with you but kind of prance around once you catch them, and finally a, oh, whoa, whoa, not again. Why was early FromSoft so set on making hot elf women? Oriol and the Rat are the two NPCs who actually help you, both showing up throughout the game to give you items, which is a nice brief respite from the plethora of hostile monsters inside the tower. This also brings me to the voice acting of characters, which is new for the series. It's quite... Oh, you are here to destroy all the monsters? <laughs> this area was built by men, yet not many around. No, no, but there are some of your kind below. Peak, honestly. Top tier voice acting. There are a couple more unique features that Shadow Tower boasts. A bestiary that shows a lots of information about every creature you come across, including the stat boosts they give you after being slain, which in itself is a variation off of Kingsfield's leveling system. Instead of giving you XP that works towards flat level ups, enemies give you minor amounts of points in your wide array of stats. You could potentially kill thousands of monsters throughout a playthrough, so it makes sense for them to only give you a few points while bosses give you a more substantial amount. This gives you a greater incentive to kill enemies as now not only do they have a vast drop table of potentially useful items, but you are also getting stronger with each foe you kill. Combat itself is only slightly different. While you still strafe around with enemies and wait for your stamina bar to recharge slowly, blocking is a new mechanic unique to Shadow Tower, although it's only situationally useful. Surprisingly, throughout three Kingshield entries, the shield was still merely a stat bonus. Now, they can be used to actively mitigate decent amounts of damage, potentially allowing the player to rush into enemies with disregard for timing or play more recklessly. You don't often need a shield, but when your back is against the wall, it's a hell of a lot better than taking full damage. There is also one funky ass room that opens up to an immediate unending stream of constant unavoidable damage that really sucks. What the fuck was that? And is much more survivable with a shield. I don't want to complain too much about game design. Frankly, Shadow Tower doesn't have many design choices that are objectively bad. Almost every design feature and mechanic in this game serves to make Shadow Tower an intentionally difficult and stressful experience. So if the stiff controls, dense dungeons, or punishing enemies get on your nerves, that was the point. This specific trap even serves that purpose, but it is quite bullshit placement after a gauntlet of 
have over a dozen tough enemies in a cave of acid that's constantly damaging you as well. The game also establishes that doors are a safe transition all up until this point, so there's no reason for the player to expect something like this two-thirds into the game. It ends up being a cheap kill since the player will likely panic. You don't even know what is killing you or even that you are being killed because it happens so quickly. I feel like this trap is just poorly placed and is a bit unfair compared to everything else in the game. If it was placed slightly further to where the player could see the projectiles and wasn't immediately dying after a loading screen, then it would be completely fair game. That being said, this is one of, if not the only truly ridiculous moment in Shadow Tower, which is a pretty big compliment to its refined and restrained difficulty as even Kingsfield 3, a game I absolutely loved, had multiple outstanding moments of poor structuring that Shadow Tower doesn't even come close to matching. Enemies also have unique weaknesses and resistances, as I'm sure existed in Kingsfield as well to an extent, only in Shadow Tower it's much more prevalent with a visual damage number and the ability to switch your weapons mid-combat. The game actually has multiple useful but unexplained hotkeys outside of the manual. Pressing circle in either your attack or block buttons will cast one of your two selected spells. Pressing X then either of those same buttons allows you to hot switch your sword or shield, useful if either are going to break or if you want to quickly swap between a sword or bow without having to navigate the slow menus and loading screens. I may have remapped my circle and X button, so be aware of that on default controls, but regardless, your combat options are effectively doubled in any given encounter compared to your single loadout in King's Field. You can also remap each button individually in this game compared to the presets of King's Field 3, yet another accessibility win for early FromSoft. If I had to strafe with the shoulder buttons, I'm sure Shadow Tower would be even harder to play. I know I haven't focused much on the structure or progression of Shadow Tower, nor its cool-looking bosses or story, but that's either because it would be too sporadic or not have much depth to discuss. Don't get me wrong, the journey is not boring, there are plenty of interesting standout moments, but talking about them would be all over the place, spoilery, and make the whole video drag out if I went in chronological order. Shadow Tower itself doesn't have much of a story, it's more so about the experience and what you make of it. Therefore, even the shallow moments moments of going through the motions, walking through creepy corridors and fighting to survive, while not having much to say about them, still mean something, but as an experience rather than words to convey. As for the story, there are a few bits and pieces scattered around the spire that barely connect or lead to anything substantial. I'm not very interested in the dialogue or writings on the walls, as it's way more interesting to speculate on the unanswerable questions that the tower provokes and soak in the visual storytelling instead. Supposedly, almost everything within the tower was created by a corrupt lord to maybe conquer a kingdom or at least protect his own reign, which is why we have to fight through so many demons to get to the bottom. Not everything down here is immediately hostile though. It's as if the Shadow Crown has merely merged all of these realms together and drawn forth mindless automatons, while the rare natural denizens of these realms have their own free will. Some of them are ambivalent or even help you, while others honor you before combat or rave about your futile journey. Which makes it feel like the Spire is alive, with its reins in the hands of a fearful king rather than created on its own from a wish or curse. The Holy Land of Zepter is cursed with this artifact, but maybe the tower itself wasn't always corrupt. As our mercenary makes his way through the tumultuous tower, slaying the six great lords of each realm, he finds himself in a beautiful, yet ominous, endless hallway. There lies an honorable guard that leads to a pretty badass fight. Afterwards, though, we see the dredge of the spire seething in a pool of his own demise. Whoever took the crown this time was transformed into a disgusting mockery of life, who lives in fear of his own power being taken away unable to truly live. This is horrific in a sad, twisted way. We've seen the Spire kill many, many adventurers already, drying out their corpses and flinging them down bottomless pits, but we haven't seen them befall fates worse than death. Maybe some of the humanoid enemies we've faced thus far have similarly been transformed into abominations, those we unknowingly slain. It's another mystery as to why Roos desires the very same demon crown, but perhaps he'll be different and use it to spread a prosperous kingdom, as that's all we see before the game comes to a close. This crown gave me power to become a conqueror. Yep. That's Shadow Tower for you. But perhaps the most Shadow Tower moment of this game lies in its overlooked versus mode. The 
most unbalanced fighting game I've ever played that allows the game to lie on its cover to claim it's for two players. In this game mode, you have access to almost your entire bestiary, which you will use against your opponents to pit chosen monsters against each other. You can pick up to three and actually control them in battle. Some are incredibly fast for some reason, while others are very slow. Some are capable of one-shotting most monsters with a single projectile attack, while others deal pitiful amounts of damage with their only move. This truly is the fighting game of all time. I would love to see a competitive Shadow Tower vs. mode scene because of its almost complete lack of balance. Take for instance, there's nothing stopping your opponent from picking drastically stronger monsters than you, as the mode requires two separate memory cards and saves. If you were theoretically playing as intended, that means you not only need two memory cards, presumably played by different people, but also a friend. Truly the hardest requirement of the game mode. You can make the same save on a second memory card, but you can't choose the same file twice, so clearly they intended both players to have their own saves, especially with the item wager system that doesn't work when both players have the same items. So if little Timmy only got two hours into the game, his acid slime is no match for Omega Lizard God Soldier or fucking Necron from Kingsfield 2 who can disintegrate an enemy with a single AoE move. Of course, you could agree to use monsters on the same tier, as most people would focus on the latter half of the bestiary, but the problem still persists when they fluctuate drastically in power, health, and speed. There's not much of a way of knowing if a monster is good or not before you're in the thick of battle and get melted by a single projectile. Lower placement in the bestiary does not always guarantee strength, because your attacks may still be pitiful in comparison to the other monsters. It seems like some effort of balancing was made, since most creatures seem to have a relatively low amount of HP, even the top tiers, so they're not impossible to kill, but it's hard to know when there's no damage number for attacks like in the base game. It would take rigorous testing to figure out what enemies are especially tanky versus what attacks just deal minimal damage. It's cool to be able to play as the various monsters in Shadow Tower, but the best part of this mode is the ridiculous intense music that doesn't quite match with how quick and underwhelming most fights are. No, no, please! Not the still luck! Not the still luck! Please! No! <laughs> These tracks are bangers and have no right being only 30 seconds long. It's even more hilarious that this is half of the total music in Shadow Tower, while being a completely different vibe and only a minute and a half in total. These tracks actually give more of a Spriggan Lunarverse feeling than the Evergrace vibes of the other half, which kind of makes sense given Kota Hoshino did compose part of that soundtrack as well. Spriggan Lunarverse is far from a typical FromSoft game, but it is in my sights to cover in the future. Just a long long time from now since I gotta learn some basic Japanese first. While Shadow Tower on a gameplay level isn't too fundamentally different from the Kingsfield series, it's far darker aesthetically, giving a more ominous overtone to the game than the previous Kingsfield entries. I loved Shadow Tower on my second playthrough, when everything clicked together and I understood the purpose of all the game's design features. Would I recommend it? At a base level, yes, you should absolutely experience Shadow Tower firsthand if you liked this video, but only if you are familiar with harsh old school dungeon crawlers or have played the rest of the Kingsfield series first. Shadow Tower is not a good entry point into the From Software catalog, at least in my experience, when I couldn't get invested even six hours in. But now, after playing the Verdite trilogy, I was able to properly appreciate the choices and improvements this game makes. Shadow Tower is a solid game. It got heavily mixed reviews at the time because I'm sure it was split between people who absolutely did not get it, or people familiar with Kingsfield who actually had the patience for that type of game, which is a real shame because I'm sure that's partially the reason why its sequel never released in the West. But that's a story for another time. This marks the end of From Software's PS1 dungeon crawlers, and soon we'll move into the exciting era of the PS2 dungeon crawlers. And action RPGs too. I would like to thank channel members Shavenger, Mega Roomba, Zap, and Patron CL for supporting me in my sporadic upload schedule. This video took me all of May to make, not to mention following up the Kingsfield 3 video that drained the soul out of me. You can probably understand why this took a little while, but thank you for supporting me. If you would like to see my full playthrough of Shadow Tower, there will be a playlist of the live streams I did in the month leading up to this video. There are plenty of funny moments that I would have loved to put in the video, but they just didn't fit anywhere. So I'll leave you with one last clip here and thank you for watching. 
what 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 ring of dark souls you can't make this shit up are you serious what? Wait, did I pick this up? Dark Souls is canon in the Shadow Tower universe now. 